Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Today's guest is Jonathan Carl, the Chief White House Correspondent for ABC News and President of the White House Correspondents Association. Over his long and award-winning career, he has reported from the White House under four presidents and more than a dozen press secretaries, and has covered every major beat in Washington. His New York Times bestselling book is Front Row at the Trump Show, which is an account like no other from the White House reporter who has known President Donald Trump for more than 25 years. Joining him is Allison Dobson, who is president of the Penguin Publishing Group and oversees Penguin's adult publishing business in the U.S. Prior to her time in publishing, Allison spent several years on Capitol Hill and on political campaigns. And now let's join Allison Dobson in conversation with author Jonathan Carl. Well, John, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for being a part of the, the podcast. It has been so fun to see how well Front Row at the Trump Show has been doing. It's such an exciting ride. Um, and of course, you and I met uh, very briefly years ago, tw- almost, I regret to say going on 20, 15, 20 years ago, uh, when I was back in, in politics in Washington on the Hill, and, and then of course on um, in the 2004 campaign. So it's fun to, to close the circle here and see you back, um, see you back in, this, in this venue. It's great, you that was a lot of fun a very back big, then. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But politics is very different now. From yeah. And you've had a long career in politics. Politics is very different now. Um, how, when I look back at my career 15, 20 years ago, I, and I think about politics, the, the situation now, I, I just can't really believe how different sort of the environment is. And I know that feels like a cliche, but I really sense it myself. Do you feel that it's just, that it's, that way, or do you feel like this was sort of a natural evolution of where we, you know, where we've been going for the last few years? Well, I describe a scene in, in the book from that period. It's, it's January 20th, 2001, when uh, the uh, President George W. Bush was sworn in. And I, I have, it's such an interesting uh, situation because I happen to have been in the exact same position for that inauguration than I, that I was uh, for Donald Trump's inauguration. So, you know, 20 years, um, uh, all, you know, 16 years apart, you're, um, the, the, these two incredibly divisive elections, because you remember, it was, it, America was really divided, because you had, of course, yeah. a presidential election that ended basically in a tie. Uh, you had the recount yeah. in Florida, um, and you had the popular vote winner losing to the electoral vote uh, winner after the Supreme Court stopped the Florida recount. So I was on, and I, I described this scene in the book, I was on a flatbed truck in front of George W. Bush's presidential limousine right after he gave his uh, you know, inaugural address, had the, 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 the first luncheon with the members of, of of Congress and then, and then made his trek down to the White House for the very first time as President of the United States. And I was on the same flatbed truck, well, maybe a different truck, but the same scene, a flatbed truck in front of <laughs> Donald Trump's uh, limousine. And um, these were both very contentious presidential elections. And I, I described the scene, and by the way, the reason why this is is because they, they've been doing this um, for, for a long time where the networks are, are allowed to have cameras that drive on, on these flatbed trucks and a correspondent from each network in front of the presidential limo. So we're kind of part of the parade, part of this, you know, the inaugural parade from the Capitol to, to the White House. And um, we, we think about how divided our country is right now. We are incredibly deeply divided, obviously. Um, but the scene in 2001 might have been more intense. Um, and it wasn't mm-hmm. captured in the way 2016 was because we didn't have, you know, we didn't all have iPhones and we weren't all, not everybody was shooting everything, but there were protesters up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. And there was even a point where I saw um, somebody throw an egg at, uh, at, the, at the presidential limousine in 2001. It was really intense, really tough. And, and, and all the signs saying, not my president, you know, all the signs denouncing the uh, 
the Supreme Court, the legitimacy of the election. There were also protesters in 2017, in January, when I went in front of uh, Donald Trump. So I, I just think it's an important reminder that, yes, I do believe what you've said is true. It, it feels like a different time. This is different. But the deep divisions that, uh, that, that we see and that we, that we see play out right now uh, are not new. What's new is we, we, we have entered, a, a, we, we have a political figure unlike any we have ever seen in American history. Not only is he the first time, you know, the, 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 first, the first president we've ever had who had absolutely no experience in either the military or government, none. That's never happened before. Um, it, it's the first time we've had a reality star as president. And, <laughs> and, and, and the divisions are deep still, but the divisions are more profound now because I believe you have a situation where uh, not only do the two sides disagree on what direction our country should go in, but they disagree on basic facts. You know, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's like half the country won't believe anything that is said out of the Trump White House, and the other half of the country, and I'm only slightly exaggerating those numbers, it's like maybe it's like 40%, 35% on each side, but you know, a good chunk of the country won't believe anything that comes out of the Trump White House, and a good chunk of the country won't believe anything they read in a newspaper. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's the part that's just hard to imagine, sort of how we get to the other side, right? I mean, wh- yeah. how will we sort of bridge that divide? Yeah. But you have a big job covering uh, the Trump administration, certainly. It keeps you on your toes. When you think about the process of, of, of writing a book, um, you know, I know in this world, the tweet, the first tweet, breaking the news in the tweet, um, that's, or, you know, online and, and getting the first uh, media hit on a story is so important. How do you, uh, when you thought about writing the book, how did you go about that process and sort of change um, your mindset, if you will, to sort of the long game of writing a book versus the short game of the daily news cycle and the daily, you know, all of the things that happen every day and your daily reporting and hourly reporting all the time at the White House? It's been the busiest news environment that I could ever have possibly imagined. And when I first met you up on Capitol Hill, we were going through some really intense times. I mean, I was up on Capitol Hill during 9-11, the anthrax attacks, uh, uh, we had a 50-50 Senate that changed hands because one senator switched parties. That was a story I broke, by the way, on CNN. I mean, these were huge, really busy and intense times. Um, But the the relentless pace of the news environment uh, and, 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 and the rapidity of the news cycle is so much more now. But I knew coming in with with Donald Trump coming in, and I probably decided it on that inauguration when I went into the White House minutes after Trump went into the White House, and most of his staff still wasn't there, and the place was empty. Uh, Even like a lot of the reporters weren't there yet because the uh, the, what we call the press pool was stuck up on the Capitol. There had been a logistics meltdown and you know and, and, and the reporters who had been up on the Capitol hadn't been able to get into the uh, a lot of them hadn't been able to get into the White House yet and I wandered around and all of the old pictures that are on the wall the Obama family were taken down uh, the uh, the desks were all emptied there were you know a few scattered computers you know with cords hanging out uh, there was nobody there and I ran into Steve Bannon I ran into Sean Spicer and they were all you know for the most part had never been in the place, had any experience in the White House. Um, and, I, and I realized it was like I was witnessing a pivotal moment in American history, and I felt that I wanted to do more than just go out and do my story about this happened today and the president mm-hmm. said this and we did that. And these are big, important stories that we do every day. But I was like, I wanted to get deeper. I wanted to really explain not just the news that was transpiring, but what this experience is like, and what this moment was like. So I started taking, um, I, I've, I've been a journal, I've been keeping journals since, um, I've been keeping a journal since I was a, a sophomore in college. Uh, you know, not, not always with the frequency that I should. Sometimes it's every day and then sometimes, you know, weeks will go by and I don't do something. But I, I started really keeping um, more, in, more careful notes and knowing that I, was, I wanted to come back to each of these moments and I wanted to find out. And so much with the, with the crush of news, you don't have a chance to really 
go to the second and third layer to find out what was really behind the news that just happened. So I kept notes, including questions of things that I wanted to go back and find out more that I didn't have time to dive into. Um, and and I, you know, when I when I decided to finally go forward and write the book, when I had a moment to breathe, I mean, working like eighteen, sometimes twenty hours. A day, I mean, really, I mean, the a relentless news cycle. Uh, I, I went back to those notes, um, and that was my raw material. And then I went back and I tried to get answers to the questions that I had asked myself as these events were unfolding and go back and talk to the people that were at the center of these events. And some of them had already left the White House. Many of them had already left the White House. And I found that people were willing to talk to me it, to, to a degree beyond anything I had imagined because the, the, the crush of the moment was gone. And they could get, there. and also they wanted to get their side out there, I guess. But also, you know, there was like, there was time to talk about it. I mean, I, I recount in the book, John Kelly, who was the president's second chief of staff, I had a series of conversations with him, uh, really beginning with his first day as chief of staff, where he would talk to either me or a small group of reporters and talk off the record. And he was really remarkably candid. And I couldn't use any of it because it was off the record. Um, but it was, but I kept all the notes, everything that he had said to me. And then when I came time to write the book, I went and asked all these various people to talk to me. John Kelly refused to grant me an interview, which was really disappointing. Mm. And then as I was nearing the end of my kind of first draft, um, I called him up and I said, okay, I understand you don't want to do an interview, but there was something he had told me and I was like, can I... Can, you just, can I put that on the record? Can I report? And he, he said something, and, I, and I'll never forget the moment because I was running into the White House to cover something. I wrote this book largely while I was still covering, you know, what was going on day to day. But all I cared about was the book, you know. And I remember I was, I was actually in my car on Pennsylvania Avenue getting ready to park and run into, a, you know, into a briefing at the White House. And, um, and he, uh, and I called him up, and he, and he picked up the phone, and he told me, Actually, anything I told you, you can use. Off the record, if I said it, I said it. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like A gold treasure mine. trove just yeah, unfolded, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, it's funny, you, um, all of these different experiences that you, you know, that you wrote about throughout the book, and many of them, as you say, with characters that have come and gone, um, and, and certainly before all this pandemic, but many of these stories help illuminate how, who this man is and how he runs his, you know, his administration and his White House, and, and really, I think, leads into this, the pandemic response and how, um, how the administration has ultimately handled the pandemic uh, response. Can you talk about that a little bit and really how the book's title itself has sort of taken on new meaning as, as, you, as, as we are here today um, the, the, in this new time? The timing is just amazing. Uh, one of the big challenges I, I spoke about with John Parsley as we began this, prod, th th this project, my great editor on this book, um, was how are we going to end this book? And I didn't have an answer, actually, until I, until like, you'll see, I don't even need to, but the, the, the ending was like yeah. perfect. <laughs> I got yeah. a gift to this thing that just, it was the perfect coda for this book. But even so... You know, you wonder, am I going to be overtaken by events? And as I was writing the book, the impeachment was underway. Uh, my last edits were corrections were put in place before the Senate trial played out. And if the book had come out in the midst of the Senate trial, I think it would have felt like it's still a great read. You learn much about what all happened, but it would not have felt particularly relevant because I didn't dwell on the Russia investigation I you know, only touched briefly on Ukraine. I mean, that was not my focus. Um, and then it comes out, and we're in the midst of this pandemic, and everything that I've written about in this book, about how Donald Trump operates, about how he sees his, uh, his administration, about how he judges his own success, about how he uses the media, attacks the media, tries to manipulate the media, all played out in vivid technicolor. Um, as, as we saw him, I mean, he was, he started holding the daily press briefings and literally was talking about his ratings, the ratings of these great coronavirus press briefings. He started talking about the reviews 
the reviews that we're getting for our testing, the reviews we're getting for our ventilators, the reviews we're getting for how we're dealing with the governors. We're getting great reviews. And I write in the book, in the beginning, of this is the Trump show. He tracks the ratings. He, he, uh, he courts the critics. He reads the reviews. He attacks. He, I mean, it, it all played out. I mean, this is like, you know, in, cause, cause at the, you know, this is the first time that Donald Trump has faced an external crisis of any serious magnitude. It's been crisis after crisis after crisis in this administration, but they've been largely self-inflicted. You know, it's been personnel upheaval. It's been uh, the way he dealt with, um, you know, the firing of James Comey, the Ukraine call. It's the, 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 the travel ban. It's Charlottesville. These are all crises that played out, but they were all, you know, in some way triggered by his own actions. This is the first thing that just comes like a bolt of lightning and it's wild because it's the, the, his, the way he's approached it, the management style, the way the staff has tried to deal with him, tried to manage him, the way he has directed his own his own show here, which I really do believe he, I'm not saying he doesn't care about the, 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 the pain that this has inflicted on our country, I, I believe he does, but he sees it all as how is it playing, how are my actions going to play on the cable news channels uh, in the New York Times tomorrow. He really, that's how he tracks it. That's, that's reality to him. It's the perception. And, and that's what I write about in the book, and here it is playing out in much more graphic terms than, than I ever could have imagined. And I mean, let's get into history a little bit too. You've known Trump longer than anyone currently at the White House, yeah, I guess with the exception of his own his own daughter. <laughs> yes. um, and one of the great stories, of course, that are, is in the book that I really love um, is how you first met him back in the 90s when you were at the New York Post. Um, but I'd love to ask you about another early Trump story that he actually gave you a, a promotional quote or what we call a blurb um, <laughs> for your first book. Um, so you really have a lot of history with him. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we we debated we debated uh, John uh, Parsley and I uh, whether or not we should uh, somehow put that in, you know, on, on the book cover or something, you know, because it, it, it's really <laughs> it's really classic. Um, it just it just shows you the kind of relationship he had uh, with with reporters. He really courted and 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 wanted he wanted attention. He always always has. That's that's Donald Trump. And um, he, he uh, I had written, I wrote a book in, uh, in 1995. It's called The Right to Bear Arms, uh, The Rise of America's New Militias. It was a book about the militia movement that, uh, that, that, that surrounded the Oklahoma City, you know, the Michigan militia, which um, McVeigh, you know, uh, McVeigh was part of, and, and that whole movement around the Oklahoma City bombing that was revealed. And, and I did this, I wrote this book, and it has nothing to do with Trump. Uh, at all, at all, um, and and I didn't. I, I was having a book party, you know, like we were going to have for this book, by the way, but we had to cancel because we canceled everything. <laughs> we um, can have a virtual toast. <laughs> yeah, so so I was having a book party at a place called the Heartland Brewery, which is right off of uh, uh, Union Square Park in New York, and it was really a party for my friends and my family, and you know, I mean, th this was a paperback uh, a book and. Um, and I was putting together an invitation, and my invitation, this is not for the book jacket, this is for the invitation. I had had some of my friends give me quotes, like, wow, this book's the slam bang read. This is the, you know, just kind of like, yeah. you know, just kind of like, just kind of like have fun. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to call Donald Trump and see if he'll give me a quote. And I called him up, and, and uh, you know, he, of course, took the call and uh, asked for the book. And I sent him. I sent him the manuscript, and uh, he got back to me, and he said, "Yeah, fine. Uh, you, you write the quote and send it to me." So I wrote a quote. So not only did I get a quote from Donald Trump, but this was the first and only time that I was a ghostwriter for Donald J. Trump. <laughs> and the quote is, if I'm, "I'm doing this from memory," but it was, "What a book." Um. Jonathan Carl is one of the best in the business. Tough, fair, and brutally honest. <laughs> <laughs> Words that we should we should remind him of these days, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. 
Well, I also want to acknowledge a little bit, um, you know, taking a taking a little pass from um, from Trump. I uh, for getting into the spring, of course, and uh, getting on to. We just had Mother's Day. It's coming into June, into Father's Day, and I I wanted to to reference in the acknowledgments. You write it really, really movingly. I thought about your father, Wayne Carl, and your stepfather, uh, Howard Schaff, both of whom passed away recently, um, and, and the influence that they've had on you. Um, and I, I wondered if you might speak a little bit about how their influences helped shape the narrative of your book and, and really this, you know, the, how the book came to be. Oh, they, 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 they sure did. Two, two remarkable people, kind of my, my yin and yang, they were so incredibly different um and uh my um my my father it was just he, he's a guy he he uh owned a uh an auto body shop in uh in, in connecticut that was started by my grandfather um it goes back to 1925 it was kind of funny because my grandfather had older brothers that started car dealerships just as cars were becoming a thing and uh, and then by the time my grandfather you know got old enough, he was like, well, the, they've, his brothers already had the dealership, so he was like, well, well, I'll fix the cars, you know. And <laughs> and, and my dad was uh, was a was a lifetime firefighter, uh, ten years as the chief of the volunteer fire department in our town. Um, he was a guy that was you know he was he, he was in the president of the Kiwanis Club. He was just he was a, he was a a community service guy. And one of the most patriotic people I've ever met. Not, he didn't really get involved in politics on the national level. He, you know, it was all local, 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 and um, didn't miss, never missed a, a Memorial Day uh, or a Fourth of July parade. Um, had, uh, you know, every every house we were in, you know, he he had a flagpole installed and was very serious about having the flag up. Taking, I mean, he was just he was. Um, he was a real community figure and somebody anybody could rely on. You know, he's the kind of guy, like I said, who would run into a run into a house that was on fire. I mean, you know, he, he, these firefighters, you know, you know, they're they're heroes. And this was my dad, and just blew me away. Um, and and he took such pride in my work. Um, he uh, he after he died, he died um, about two and a half years ago, and. He, I, I found I found actually the invitation that had the Trump quote I no longer had anymore. I found it in his papers. He had like oh, um, wow. I mean the articles I had written in the New York Post. He he would he would call me up. Um, he would call me up after um, you know I, I was on the uh, on the air unless like, like I said and I wrote the acknowledgement unless I called him first. Uh, and he was just the, the ultimate supportive guy and and loved everything that I was doing and tracked it all. He he, did, he never followed national politics until I started reporting on national politics, and then my and then my stepfather Howard Schaff um, um, was a uh, had been a taxi driver in uh, in Brooklyn. He he served uh, in the Air Force during uh, South Korea, and. Um, was a writer. He never never went to college, but he wrote six novels, which we haven't published yet. So at some point, we'll have to call you up and see if we can. Uh, but yeah. but uh, but but the, but the books that he got published, he started writing biographies, and, and this is where he, he he took me and my mom. Um, we, we we loaded up in in an old Chevy van and, and rode across country uh, one summer um, when I was um, in fifth grade, and we stopped in South Dakota and went to Mount Rushmore. And he became really fascinated with Mount Rushmore and how how it was built, who the sculptor was, how it was, you know, how they did it. And there wasn't much information up there. It was all about the presidents, which he was interested in too. But he really wanted to know how who was the, who was the artist, what was what was his story. And um, we went back, and I went back into school in fifth grade. And he had written to the University of South Dakota, and somehow got them to agree to uh, have him go around and try to do an oral history of everybody who had worked on the construction of Mount Rushmore. The art, the sculptor died in 1941, but the, you know all the, the the miners and the people that worked on it. So I got out of school like a month into fifth grade, and we went to South Dakota, and we moved into these two adjoining motel rooms uh, outside of the town of Hill City, which at that time had a population of 350 people. And there's no Google to find a list of where all the workers are, you know. Uh, so uh, they ran an ad in the, in the hills in, 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 the, in the Rapid City Journal, and uh, and started and got a couple of people to respond, and then got a couple other people. And I, I missed loads of school. 
went to school at Hill, Hill City High School, which is K to 12, <laughs> um, and, uh, and went to school. And I tra- but we also, we, we, we left and traveled, because not all these people were still in South Dakota. Some were in, you know, we went to Modesto, California. We went to outside Las Vegas for another person. We went all over the place. And, um, and he taught me how to interview, because I, I sat in on those interviews. And he always told me, you know, the key to a good interview is you don't even know the interviewer is there. Get them to tell their yeah. story. Make them feel comfortable, whoever you're talking to, and talk as little as you possibly can. And, you know, so both of them were incredibly influential and just, you know. Howard died um, uh, about, a, a, about a, a, a year before my dad did. He died shortly after, just days after the, uh, the presidential election. And... You know, my, my, my dad would have been more Republican, Howard uh, more Democrat. Um, I went to see him in his hospital, you know, rushed to his bedside after, after the election. And uh, his last words to me, um, I, he had the, the, there was CNN or one of the cables was on in his hospital room. And, of course, it was all about the fallout from the election. And he wasn't really communicating anymore, um, but he was, he was watching. And I said to him, Howard. So I used to always try to get him going on stuff, you know. Howard, what are we going to do about Trump? And he looked at me and he said, "That's your problem." And those were the last words he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he was he was quite serious about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you certainly uh, made them both proud. I know you. I'm sure you do every day. Um, but but certainly with this book, it's something that. I'm sure that they're proud of, and I hope that you are. We certainly are very proud of this book and, um, and very proud to, to publish it. And, and uh, it's been really exciting to see it uh, connect with so many people um, who are learning about this extraordinary, extraordinary president. No matter where you uh, sit on the political spectrum, you, you truly cannot deny uh, that this is an extraordinary president and, and a, very, uh, a time we'll look back from on for, you know, throughout the rest of history. So. It's, it's an extraordinary story. We'll be talking about this when we're, you know, you know, hopefully deep into our old age, sitting on a porch somewhere. <laughs> um, and, and I, want to, I want to thank, I want to thank you, Allison. I want to thank, uh, uh the, the, the really good folks at Dutton, um, for believing in this project. Cause I have to be completely honest with you right now that, um, the book, proposal that I did, which I did, it was like on the fly because there was so much going on. Um, I think it was uh, the, the, the fall of 2018 and we're going into the midterms and there's just like chaos all around. And uh, the, um, the final product is very different from the book proposal. And I think, and I hope, I, I know John Parsley agrees with this, it's a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> than the original <laughs> idea. I mean, because I, I really didn't know exactly where I'd be going. I knew that I had to write about this experience and I wanted to get to it, but I hadn't begun doing any of the interviews for it. I had my, I had my journal notes. I had, some, I had ideas in my head. But, the, but this book became something much, I think, much bigger and much better and much more important as, as the writing process went forward. And and uh, I want to thank you for, for, for believing it in the beginning and for, and for to John Parsley for, you know, I called him and would just talk to talk him through like some of my crazy ideas and some of my ideas that ended up working, some, a lot that didn't end up working. I was like, what do you think about this? And he was always, you know, he's always there to talk me through. And um, so I really, I really want to thank It's been a pleasure, pleasure working with you, with, with you and your team. Great. Well, we've loved having you uh, as part of our team too. And, and uh, listen, there's nobody better than John Parsley. I'm glad you guys got, we're, we're such a good team together. So yeah. that's, that's terrific. And now here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. I didn't have his phone number, so I dialed the one listed in the phone book for the Trump organization. Can I speak to Donald Trump, I asked. It was an audacious call. I had been working as a reporter in New York City for less than a year. I had never met the man. And at this moment, Trump's home and office were the epicenter of the most intense media frenzy I had ever witnessed. What do you want? The woman on the line was Norma Federer, Trump's longtime gatekeeper, and someone so integrally involved in all of his dealings, 
business and personal that the New York Times had reported a few years earlier, some suspect she runs the company. At this point, all I knew about Donald Trump was what I had read in the newspapers or seen on television. But I figured I knew enough to say exactly the right thing to get him on the phone. It was August 1994, and the public was fixated on the tabloid story of the decade. Michael Jackson had just secretly married Lisa Marie Presley, the king of pop, together with the daughter of the king of rock and roll. And the newlyweds, who had not yet been spotted together in public, were trying to stay out of sight right in the middle of Manhattan at Trump Tower. The news had brought a mob of paparazzi, Michael Jackson fans, Elvis Presley fans, and a parade of onlookers hoping to catch the first glimpse of the married couple. So many people had surged to Trump Tower that the NYPD had cordoned off the sidewalks around the building, forcing the growing crowd to watch from across the street. I was a 26-year-old reporter more interested in politics than celebrity sightings and had spent most of my time reporting on a new mayor in City Hall named Rudy Giuliani. But I was working for the New York Post, and on this particular day, my editors only cared about one story. So I made what I believed would be a slam-dunk pitch to get Trump on the phone. I want to do a story on why the most famous newlyweds in the world would want to have their honeymoon at Trump Tower. And sure enough, I got a quick call back. Donald Trump was on the line telling me to come on over. Along with New York Post photographer Francis Specker, I hustled uptown to Trump Tower. Walking past the police line set up to keep the paparazzi mobs away, I was whisked up to meet Donald Trump in an office on the 26th floor filled with framed magazine covers featuring his favorite subject, Donald Trump. It was a whirlwind from the start, a private tour of Trump Tower given by the man himself. The ground rules were simple. He would show me everything. I could use all the information he gave me and I could quote him as a source in the Trump organization. We met with Michael Jackson's bodyguards and photographed the basement tunnels Jackson and Presley were using to get in and out without being spotted by the mob outside. He showed me a blue van with tinted windows in the garage, the couple's secret getaway car. He showed it all off, from basement to penthouse, and along the way, my source in the Trump organization gave me all the gossipy details. I learned the terms of Michael Jackson's lease of the apartment directly below Trump's own. He wanted me to know that Michael and Lisa Marie had lots of famous neighbors. Steven Spielberg had an apartment on the 64th floor, Andrew Lloyd Webber on the 60th. My source pointed out the apartments he said were owned by Elton John, King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, Sophia Loren, and the British royal family. He told me of a woman who bought one apartment for several million dollars and then bought the one below so she could build a swimming pool. It's the most expensive pool in the world, my source in the Trump organization told me. None of this was serious, but my editors at the New York Post ate it up. They had a screaming front page headline, Inside Michael's Honeymoon Hideaway, and four separate articles inside the newspaper, including one headlined, Tour Bears the Secrets of Lisa and Michael's Honeymoon Nest. If any of the residents at Trump Tower were unhappy with the New York Post printing a graphic of the building with arrows pointing to where the famous lived, they would need to take it up with a source in the Trump Organization. The Post had a big exclusive for the front page, and I had a new source. At one point while he was showing me his apartment on the 68th floor, it had the same floor plan and decor as Michael's, he told me. Trump stopped, turned, and asked me if I wanted a picture. At first, I was a little confused. Didn't he notice that I had come with a photographer who had been snapping photos the entire time? But I quickly realized he was asking me if I wanted to get a picture taken with him, And with that, I stood next to Donald Trump and faced my photographer, Francis Specker. At some point while I was still living in New York, I put the photo in a frame. But when I moved to Washington some two decades ago, I tossed it in a box of old photographs. And for more than a decade, it has been in that box down in my basement. Looking at the picture now, it appears to me as if it just came out of a time capsule. 
I'm wearing a heavily wrinkled suit and a tie I almost certainly bought for $3 from a New York City vendor. The background is pure Trump. A crystal chandelier, glossy marble, a decadent ceiling adorned with carved stone, and gold. Lots of gold. I have long hair and the awkward grin of a reporter trying to figure out why the guy he's interviewing suddenly stopped to pose for a photograph with him. As for Trump, he is considerably slimmer than he is now, but it is striking how little his appearance has changed. He's wearing the same style of dark suit he wears now, the same long red tie, the same facial expression I have seen in a thousand other photos. As my secret tour of Trump Tower ended, I figured this wouldn't be the last time I'd call him up and get a quick call back, but I had no idea where it would lead. I was a cub reporter for a New York tabloid. He was a flamboyant real estate developer with a scandalous personal life. As I shook his hand, I couldn't have begun to imagine his journey would ultimately lead to the White House, and so would mine. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.